Oh, howdy all, grab yourselves a beer, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today I wanted to finish a series that I've been doing, where I've been looking at the challenges in the Harvest League, uh, breaking them down into three groups. Uh, the easiest group, which I figured were the best ones to go for if you're chasing 12 challenges, are the intermediate challenges, which will take you up to 24, and then the hardest ones, which are aimed at people who are going for 36 or 40 challenges. Now, this is going to look at the ones that I feel you would do if you're going for 36 or 40, but that you might skip over uh, if your goal is to go for 24. So these are the hardest ones, at least in my opinion. Obviously, uh, sometimes people's uh, experiences will differ, and if you're having trouble with one of the ones that's not in this video, uh, I do cover them in the previous two videos in this series. Uh, one that I know a lot of people have asked questions about is turning divination cards. This one's actually pretty easy, but the thing is that it's a knowledge test, and the ones people find difficult uh, for a prophecy, you're going to want to run crystal ore maps and get the five link prophecy that way, or alternately toxic sewer maps and get the doom fletch upgrade prophecy that way. And for an influenced item, you're going to want to run siege maps and get your hands on the uh, Lord of Celebration divination card, which will give you a shaper influence scepter. Uh, in a trade league, those are trivial though. Uh, now, next up, we're going to talk about the first one that I feel is genuinely quite difficult, and that is complete encounters three. Now, this is hard modes of map bosses. Uh, let's start with the one that's really easy, and that is uh, Salazang in the Gardens map without being affected by suppressing fire. Uh, so Salazang is based upon, I think the name of the boss is the Plumed Chimeral in the T Scepter of God uh, in Act 3, and it's a pretty straightforward fight. Suppressing fire is a skill that has a similar, uh, similar animation to the Hydra's, uh, one of the Hydra's attacks where the Guardian of the Hydra fires an arrow up into the air and then there's a whole series of shots that strike the ground in front of the Hydra. Mechanically it's very similar to the player skill Bladefall except with a much smaller area. Uh, suppressing fire is very similar. Essentially your goal here is never stand directly in front of where Salazang is facing. Uh, if you do that, then the suppressing fire will still get shot off, but it'll miss you because it hits a very narrow beam directly in front of where the boss is. If you're familiar with the Shaper encounter, uh, just imagine that Salazang was the Shaper, uh, the direction that he's facing is where the ball is gonna go and keep moving so that the ball doesn't hit you. Uh, now for the three that are less trivial. Preethi Ipeka in Desert Map. Uh, the way to do this is going is a two-part two -part strategy. The first one is to ensure that every hit makes you bleed uh, by rolling a Desert Map that has players are cursed with vulnerability. Now, uh, from memory, this requires a yellow or red tier Desert Map, so you can't do it on a white tier one. You'll need at least a one or two Watchstone version of the Desert Map. When you do uh, get to the end of this encounter, uh, so you'll have that mod that uh, d uh, that players are players are affected by vulnerability. If any of the trash mobs hit you, that's the time to burst down Preethi. Now the easiest way to do this, if if your character is capable of doing stupendous amounts of damage, you might just be able to one shot the boss. Uh, but I think that's going to be something that's out of reach for most people, even most people that are going for 36 or 40. So what you're going to want to do is use two damage skills. One could be a movement skill. Uh, firstly, bring Preethi down to less than 10% using your main skill. Now this can be done uh, for, like, in case you need precision, just remove some of your damage supports. Uh, if you find that, you know, you're just accidentally killing the boss from 40% health with one shot, then just remove damage supports until you're able to slowly whittle the boss down. Once the boss is low on life, uh, and specifically less than 10% health, then at that point you want a secondary skill that has culling strike support attached to it. Even if you don't normally use culling strike support, uh, then what you're going to want to do is just simply wait until you're bleeding and then cull. Uh, that's the easiest way to do that one. Second is defeat the Fallen Queen after defeating both the Broken Prince and the Hollow Lady in Vile Pyramid map. There's two ways to do this. Firstly, the easy way. The easy way is to do this in a group with two players. First player goes in. Uh, this is, the Fallen Queen is the boss in Vile Pyramid that is already present when you get to the end encounter. So you want to kill all the trash and wound but not slay outright the Fallen Queen. And then have that player kite the Fallen Queen to the entrance of the, of the zone. The entrance of the arena, the boss arena. Then the second player comes in. 
uh, once the Fallen Queen has been kited there and is being sort of run around in circles. And the second player goes and kills the other two bosses. That's the easiest way to do this, but obviously not Solo Cellfound friendly. In Solo Cellfound, what you're going to want to do is mimic the role of the, that the first player was playing there with Decoy Totem. So you're going to want to use a Decoy Totem even if your character normally doesn't. Uh, go in there, damage the Fallen Queen so that she gets aggroed onto you, uh, run to the entrance of the arena, drop a Decoy Totem near your feet, and then get the hell away from there. You're going to need to resummon your Decoy Totem as it gets killed, because it probably will. You might also want to uh, augment up the defenses of your Decoy Totem so that it can survive. You don't want to actually go to the extent of pumping it up on the passive tree, but if you can use some support gems to make it a bit more durable, uh, like minion and totem elemental damage support, uh, elemental resistance support, I think that's still a thing. Uh, that may be an option as well. Okay, so next up we have defeat the Stalker of the Endless Dunes in the dig map without getting affected by Garakan Sandstorm. Uh, so, for the Darude Sandstorm here, what you're going to want to do is to go into this on a white dunes map, so, uh, sorry, on a white dig map. So you want the, a zero watchstone version of a dig map and with no mods as well. The reason you want no mods is that you want to be in a position to be as close to one-shotting Garakan as you can. You're going to want a few of these dig maps as well. Here the reasoning is that you're going to probably get this, you're going to probably fail this a couple of times. Uh, the reason for that is that the sandstorms spawn immediately, like they spawn really quickly and you can be hit by them the instant they spawn. So this is a very easy one to fail. Uh, what you want to do is simply get as close to one shot in Garakan as you can uh, and then start the fight, focus all your efforts on dodging Garakan's attacks and ideally preload damage onto the boss with mines. Uh, if you're playing a mine based character you'll find this much easier. So that's encounters three. Uh, like I said, I think that's going to be one, everyone that's going for 36 is going to need to do this, uh, but it's definitely quite a bit harder than the easiest 28, which have been in the earlier videos. Uh, next up we have Complete Delirium Encounters. Uh, this one's an interesting one, in that the first two parts of it are very, very, very easy. Uh, if you have any familiarity at all with the Delirium uh, mechanics, then you'll have no trouble here. Uh, face your fears by passing through a delirium mirror simply means start a delirium encounter. You'll probably get this without trying by the time you get to about act day. Socket a cluster jewel, you're probably going get, to get this very early in mapping. Complete the simulacrum, however. Uh, the simulacrum is a map that it is a unique map that is formed by getting 300 delirium splinters. De to get delirium splinters, what you want to do is not just kill as many monsters as possible while under the effect of the delirium mirror. But you also want to kill them as far from the origin point as you can. Uh, and so that's by, how, uh, that's by player pathing over the map uh, distance. So, you know, like the further, that, the further that you need to run from where the Delirium Mirror is to where you kill the monster, the more Delirium Splinters you'll get. This means that the very best maps for acquiring these Simulacrum Splinters are maps like Promenade that are extremely, extremely long and linear. A very predictable layout. Other good ones are Burial Chambers, Melformation, Tropical Island, uh, maps like that that have a, ve a very much a go from point A to point B and run a long long way in a very straight line. So run those maps, uh, eventually you'll get enough Simulacrum Splinters to open the Simulacrum. The Simulacrum itself is a viciously difficult map. Uh, it's possibly the hardest unique map in the game with the exception of the Hall of the Grandmasters. Uh, the bosses in it are brutal, or well, one of them isn't brutal, one's quite easy, but one of them is brutal, and you will need to beat both bosses in order to complete the simulacrum. Uh, additionally, the map mods in the zone will change every wave. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact that the simulacrum starts easy. It's a 20 wave fight. The first 12 waves are pretty easy. For any character that's beating tier 16 maps, waves 1 through 12 of the simulacrum will be pretty trivial. Uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 will start to test your character a little bit, but won't feel harder than an 8 mod tier 16 map. But then waves 18, 19, and 20 will be out to kill you. So that's a difficult map, and that is the reason that this, uh, that this particular challenge is so high up. Uh, to complete a rare map with maximum delirium, this requires burning 5 delirium orbs. Delirium orbs are not cheap this league, and even in trade league. 
even the unpopular ones like the Armorsmiths ones, uh, they're currently going for about uh, for a little bit more than one fifth of an exalt. So they're sort of like uh, 0 0.22, 0 0.23 exalts each. Uh, so five of them is going to cost you more than an exalted orb. However, uh, you'll be able to do this on a low tier map if you're having trouble. Be warned that every delirium orb applied to a map roughly makes that map three tiers harder than it would have been. Uh, so a map with five delirium orbs on it is no joke. Uh, anyway, uh, the actual difficulty of that combat encounter, as long as you don't use a tier 16 map or a map with a particularly nasty boss, uh, the, the difficulty of the encounter will not be too hard. Lastly, remember it needs to be a rare map. Uh, you don't want to accidentally do this with a scoured map and then realize, ooh, that was silly. Uh, if you want to make a really easy rare map, uh, what you can do is transmute a map, use alteration orbs until there's only one trivial mod on it, and then hit it with a regal orb to get a two mod rare map. And if you're feeling really cowardly, you can even uh, hit that with two annulment orbs. Okay, next up we have complete eternal labyrinths. Uh, the, there's two aspects of this. The first one is that you need to ac acquire all three of the eternal labyrinth, uh, uber, uber duber labyrinth keys. Uh, these are found by harvesting a Vivid Aberach Bulb, which is a tier 3 seed. Uh, so you'll need to harvest that, and then you'll have a chance to upgrade an Offering of the Goddess. So you'll need to have your own Offering of the Goddess. Uh, you'll have a chance to upgrade it to one of these three. Now, where the Labyrinth in the normal game... Now, there's four different versions of it normally. One is monster level 33, one is level 55, one is 68, and one is 75. And I'm sure that anyone that's going for the 36 or 40 challenges is very familiar with all four of those. However, uh, all three of these Uber Duba Labyrinths are most level 83. So think of the difference between a tier 8 map and a tier 16. That is the difference in the monster's inherent strength. Think of the difference in boss hit points between a tier, uh, tier 8 and a tier 16 map. Uh, you know, a lot of players that can one-shot a boss in a tier 8 map might take 15 seconds to kill a boss in a tier 16. Now imagine Azaro's hit points are increased by that amount. But that's just a starting point. These three Eternal Labyrinths also have map mods on top of them. They're not the normal mod pool. Uh, how, uh, one of them, the map mods are that uh, traps deal 80% more damage, and I think that uh, monsters act 30% faster. Uh, that's pretty dangerous. Another one makes Izaro into an absolute unit, uh, giving him a huge amount of increased AoE, increased action speed, uh, and phenomenal increase to life. Uh, and the other one, I think, uh, makes all monsters hit harder and uh, do more damage. So these are no joke, and if you're looking for... Uh, if you've got a powerful character, uh, you can expect to be challenged considerably by these. The Eternal Labyrinths uh, in question have their own rewards as well. One of them rewards you with an additional six uses of the Divine Font. That's the most expensive of the keys in, all, in the trade leagues, and so that's the one I would suggest doing last. If you're playing this, uh, if you're playing this in a trade league, I would pick up additional. I would pick up uh, the labyrinth key that enriches the labyrinth. So the one that causes all of the chests to be better, uh, because that one will enable you to get, uh, you know, to get cheaper attempts while you're learning it. Uh, you should be able to pick up the these labyrinth keys for 10, 10, and 60 chaos orbs respectively. Uh, so even even if it takes you two attempts at the most expensive one, uh, you're looking at being able to do this for an exalt or less, and you're probably harvesting those vivid aberrach bulbs anyway. So uh, it's not an unreasonable one, but it's going to take a bit of time. The main reason that this is not in the first 24 is because of the difficulty of the combat encounters. You need to be able to beat Azaro when Azaro is on god mode. The last thing to note about these eternal labyrinths is dark shrines are your friend. If you get really lucky, you might get a Divine Shrine Dark Shrine, uh, and that essentially completes the Labyrinth for you. All you need to do is not, uh, it is not disconnect, and you will win the Labyrinth. Uh, alternately, if you're not quite as lucky as that, uh, then you can get things like a Diamond Shrine, which will em empower your character considerably, uh, or a Massive Shrine, which will make you harder to kill, or a Defensive Shrine. Uh, there's lots of different Shrines that will help you out there. Uh, so those dark shrines are worthwhile getting.
Next, we have obtained harvest rewards. Uh, this one is an interesting one in that some of these are extremely rare. However, you only need eight of the 10. So let's go through them. I change a unique item into another unique item. This one comes up from the rarest of the tier one blue seeds. You will have no trouble getting this, uh, even though you might not have it for some time. Uh, this seed is 0.3% of tier one seeds will be the right seed for this. So keep, keep running maps, keep running maps. Eventually you'll get the right seed. Uh, that'll be no difficulty. You get this one basically for free. Uh, to upgrade the rarity of a scarab requires a uh, vivid vulture bulb. And these are somewhat rare, but not staggeringly so. Uh, you'll have no trouble getting this. However, when you do get a Vivid Vulture Bulb, uh, the thing that's important to note is that it doesn't always get you the upgrade or rarity of a Scarab. So you may need to harvest five or six of the Vivid Vultures in order to get this. Uh, it's not unreasonable though. For add an influence modifier to an item, this reward is linked to the to the tier four blue seed. Uh, so essentially, you're going to get this one pretty much for free. I've actually earned this one. Uh, I got it sitting in a hoarder crafting station at the moment because I don't want to use it yet. I'm going to wait for the right time to use it. Uh, but this is a this is a craft that you'll get from a tier four seed. Link six sockets on an item is an extraordinarily rare result from the most common of the blue seeds, which is the one uh, that. Uh, that changes the number of links on an item. Uh, I've still not got this and I've actually gone out of my way to buy a lot of those blue seeds. Uh, so for that reason, uh, I'm going to say that this is probably going to be one you're going to skip. Synthesis implicit modifier on an item. Uh, this is another tier four seed, uh, not hard to get. And I used it on a cluster jewel just because I had a reasonably good cluster jewel and I thought, let's go for it. And then I ended up getting a completely useless synthesis item, uh, synthesis mod for me. Uh, if you're not sure what to use this on, if you've got the option to use it on a weapon, then you should use it on a two-handed weapon that is on meta. So uh, popular choice here is to use it on a high attack speed bow. Uh, if you hit killed enemies explode dealing 5% uh, of their life as physical damage, then do not sell that base for less than a mirror of Calandra. Uh, trust me on that. They are worth that. Top end crafters will buy it for you know 200, 220, 250 exalts. Uh, alternately, if you've got the ability to use it on a piece of armor, uh, I believe, and this is this is less clear. Like with the uh, with the with the weapons, it's clear that you want to use it on a bow. Uh, with the armor options, I think that the best choice is to use it on a set of sorcerer gloves. Uh, however. There are definitely divergent opinions here. Uh, lots of people will also suggest that you use it on a hubris circlet, and I don't think there's any reason to consider going for sorcerer boots, which were popular in the Synthesis League, because they they haven't kept up with the influence mods. So uh, obtain the use of an infused Zana modifier. This one you'll get for free. Uh, it's just a really common, really common result. Add an implicit mod to a cluster jewel. There's an option to, there's a crafting option that allows you to add an implicit modifier to a jewel. Uh, cluster jewel is the rarest outcome from that, but it's not staggeringly rare. You'll get this with no trouble. Sacrifice a stack of divination cards. Uh, this one is a really common result from tier two, tier two seeds. Uh, you'll get this with no trouble. I uh, exchange a map for a synthesis unique map. I think this is one you're going to want to skip. Uh, if you get it by chance, then fantastic. Uh, otherwise, just skip it. The, there's other ones that are easy. And the last one, Sacrifice a Map to Gain Atlas Missions, is easy. It's a tier 3 seed, but it comes up a lot. So next up, we have Complete Encounters 5. And here we are talking about the most difficult of the boss hard mode encounters. So defeat Portentia the Fowl in the Waste Pool map after she has transformed at least three times and without being affected by any effluence. This is time to play, dodge the bad stuff on the ground. Uh, this is an extremely precise encounter. Uh, what you're going to want here is that you're going to want to run waste pool maps. You're going to want to be doing this on a character that is somewhat of a glass cannon if available. Uh, this is really good to do on a mine based character, uh, especially if your mine based character has very, very, very good teleport move skills. So what you need to do in this encounter 
is you need to prolong the fight with Portentia. So Portentia, if you don't remember, she is the map version of Doedre from Act 8. Doedre from Act 8 is a misunderstood boss. Uh, she has a few different attacks. Uh, one of them, she one of, in one form, she deals chaos damage. Uh, in another form, she deals physical damage. And another form, I think, is a hybrid of both. Uh, what you need to do with this fight is that you need to turn the lever three times during the fight. Each time you turn the lever, Doedre will change colour, uh, and so will, the, so will the bad stuff she puts on the ground. Now, what you're going to need to do in this fight is start at the lever, uh, press it as soon as you can, then use a teleport move skill to get into a safe spot where none of the effluence, the effluence are the, are the moving patches of bad crap on the ground. You want to uh, use a teleport move skill to get away from all the effluence. Once you've done that, uh, you then want to uh, sort of go and kite around these effluents until the lever becomes available to pull again. Do this uh, th until you've pulled the lever three times, then start preloading mines on the ground, uh, and then as soon as Doedre comes back, uh, shoot her with everything that you've got. And ideally you want to just one-shot her at that point. Uh, this is a very technically challenging encounter. Uh, and requires just a lot of a lot of player skill to dodge things. Lastly, this is nigh on impossible if you have a bad internet connection. If you have a bad internet connection, you're probably going to need to find another player who is willing to do this for you. Uh, you just need to be inside the waste pool map. You don't need to be in the Doedre encounter, and you can then just sort of sit there and let them do the work for you. Uh, there's a lot of people that will do this, and they organise in the trade channel Trade Eight Twenty. And I think a fair price for this is about half an Exalted Orb. Uh, so that's the sort of price that you can expect to pay to get someone else to do this for you. Lastly, if you're really good at this encounter, uh, if you've done this a few times and you've learned how to do it really well, uh, you, you're confident you can get it 80% of the time or more, then what you can do is actually advertise your services in Trade 820 and say, you know, selling complete encounters five, potential the foul with no effluence, uh, you know, and say 80 chaos and pay after success. A Terror of the Infinite Drifts in Desert Spring is a lot easier. Uh, this one, however, is quite challenging if you apply uh, for certain build types. Uh, if you're playing a melee build, this can be tricky. Uh, if you're playing a damage over time build, it should be trivial. And if you're playing a ranged, a ranged hit build, uh, it should be somewhere in between. So quicksand, when you stand in the quicksand, uh, there will be a stacking debuff that will appear you know, in your in your buffs and debuff section, so it'll be in this sort of area of the screen, and it will indicate the amount of stacks of quicksand you have. Uh, so this will scale up quite quickly to 10, and then once it's at 10, it'll stay there. What you want to do is use only teleport move skills to get around, and always stay in the quicksand, uh, fight, you know, deal your damage to the boss, get him fairly low, and then just zap around using your teleport move skills, and keep yourself always in quicksand. Then when you kill a boss, you're fine. Guardian of the Chimera in the Pit of the Chimera map after searching at least 25 smoke clouds. So, uh, if you're familiar with the Guardian of the Chimera fight, uh, three times throughout the fight, he will hide in, in smoke clouds. There'll be a whole bunch of smoke clouds on the map, and if you step in the wrong one, he will slap you. What you're going to want to do is get into the fight, get the Chimera down to 75%, and at that point he will go into one of the smoke clouds and put up a bunch of decoy ones. And you're just going to want to walk into one and see if the Chimera slaps you or see if it's the correct one. If you got it wrong, which you normally will because there's something like eight of them, uh, what you want to do is just keep walking in and out of it. So just go in and out, 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 in and out. Uh, and you will also want to have some sort of powerful life recovery that functions when you are not leeching when you're not leeching life. This is the hard part. Uh, ideally, you're going to want to have various layers of damage mitigation, a cast when damage taken molten shell, or cast when damage taken steel skin, or a manually cast steel skin, uh, or for that matter, arcane cloak, or something along those lines. Any sort of way that you can re that you can mitigate the damage that the chimera slaps are doing, and regenerate some life while you're taking these hits. Lastly, this is very much a fight you want to do on a map that has no map mods present at all. 
you want to be doing this on a Guardian of the Chimera map that has been freshly scoured. Finally, we have the Shaper Precision Kill. Uh, so this is just as simple as not being hit by anything except his melee range basic attack. Uh, and that's from both the Shaper and the Clone. This is something at which any ranged damage over time build, uh, whether that be the Fireball Ignatrix that I'm playing, whether it be a Toxic Rain character, uh, toxic, uh, toxic Rain Direct Attack character, Toxic Rain Miner, uh, Caustic Arrow build, anything like that. Uh, any of those, or uh, Bleed Gladiator, all very powerful builds that will be able to deal with this pretty easily. Uh, essentially, the Shaper is only dangerous if you are directly in front of him, and you just need to keep sidestepping and watching for some of the uh, big wind-up attacks, uh, big wind-up animations that he has. He has a big wind-up animation when he does his slam, and he has a big wind-up animation when he's charging his laser. Uh, if you see either of those, then you know you need to get the hell away. Uh, the, the difficult part with this is avoiding the charge up laser. The charge up laser is something that normally is not dangerous enough to merit absolutely, like to merit slowing down your damage in order to get out of it quickly. What you want to do normally is wait until the laser actually hits you and at that point then you want to move out of the way of it. At least that's my usual practice when I'm fighting the Shaper. Uh, and that's because the laser, despite being so incredibly graphically flashy, it's just not that dangerous. However, uh, you, you can't do that with this precision kill. You need to not get hit by the laser at all. And so that means you need to be anticipating when it's going to fire and just get out of the way. But it's not that bad. Winged Scarabs. Okay, here we go with the, with the brutal economic challenge. Uh, some leagues have an economic challenge, and what that means is that it's just one that requires you to waste a lot of currency. Uh, the Abyss League had one where you had to identify a an Abyss item that had two uh, that had two uh, Abyssal sockets on it. This was an incredibly, incredibly uh, messy challenge to get. And I remember being in a situation where I had a two socket Tomb Fist drop for me and it was unidentified, I sold it to someone for seven and a half exalts, they identified it and then sold back to me the base item, like the, the post-identified item for just 20 chaos. So essentially I made uh, you know 7.3 exalts on that trade just by letting them get the credit for this item that had dropped for me. Uh, this is pretty similar, This except this is going to be a more expensive economic challenge. Winged Scarabs cost about 100 chaos each. Uh, the only source of them in the game is the Vivid Vulture Bulb, uh, which doesn't guarantee you the ability to upgrade a Scarab, but if you get the ability to upgrade a Scarab, uh, you can turn a Gilded one into a Winged Scarab. Uh, so, basically, this requires 14 Lucky Crafts on Tier 3, uh, tier three uh, Harvest Seeds. This is more grinding than most people will do. If you're in solo self-found, uh, I would expect that you're just going to have to say you're probably never going to get this. Uh, obviously, extreme grinding can get you there. If you're in a trade league, you just got to decide, am I willing to pay 10x to get this challenge? If you are, buy one of each of these winged scarabs. Uh, if you're not, then leave this one out of your 36. Of course, if you're going for 40, you're just going to have to burn the 10x. Complete Encounters 6. Okay, here we go with some harder combat encounters. Uh, to defeat a possessed unique delirium boss. This is one that can be done the easy way or can be done the hard way. Uh, the easy way is to use the prophecy Tormented Foe. Uh, Tormented Foe will cause all unique monsters that spawn in a map where it procs uh, to spawn already ghosted. What you're going to want is the Tormented Foe prophecy and add it to your list of active prophecies and then you're going to want to run maps that have a single delirium orb applied to them. Maps that are 20% delirious have a pretty good chance to have Omniphobia in them. Omniphobia being one of the two unique delirium bosses. Uh, if they don't have Omniphobia, they've got a slim chance of having Kosis. Actually, I have seen both of them in one map once, but normally it seems like Omniphobia is in three quarters of them. Kosis is in 5%. So that is your best bet to actually get access to Omniphobia with a Delirium, sorry, with a Tormented Spirit and possessing him. Uh, once you've done that, you've got to actually beat the encounter, but I think if you're going for 36, you're up to that. 
To complete the domain of timeless challenge of uh, timeless conflict when all five factions are present, uh, this is one that's brutal in solo self found. You're going to need to run a very large number of legion encounters. You're going to need a, a to have 100 of every splinter plus an additional 100 of every splinter that's not Maraketh. So the Maraketh faction splinters are the rarest. You're going to need to get yourself one Maraketh emblem, two Templar emblems, two Kaori, two Val, and two of uh, Eternal emblems. Uh, once you've done that, you're going to need to earn your five. You're going to need to run a four-way uh, domain of timeless conflict. Doing that and killing one of the Legion bosses in there will grant you the five socket map device. Once you've got the five socket map device, then you can go back into the domain of timeless conflict. This time, using all five of your, or your emblems. Needless to say, this is going to be a lot of grinding because, as I think you'd, you'd know by the time you've run a few Legion monoliths, uh, it takes a lot of them to get 900 of the uh, to get 900 of the splinters. Uh, so happy grinding. Uh, if you're in a trade league, then this is something that there will be people who are very confident with this in five uh, five way Legion encounter, and those people will run the Domain of Timeless Conflict and will sell a portal to it for typically 25 to 30% of the cost that they've paid for their set of five emblems. This can be a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, again, you're paying someone else to do the difficult parts of it for you, but they'll have a character that's specialized in performing well in the five way, uh, five -way challenge. Uh, additionally, you'll get quite a bit of loot out of it as well. Uh, and now we have the fun one. Kill a monster with five essences in an area of level 80 or higher. Okay, this is one where the number of essences that monster can spawn with it seems to vary with the item quantity of the zone. And in my experience, uh, it varies both with the item quantity that is inherent to the zone that you're in, but also with player-based increased item quantity. That is the key to this one. If you're in a trade league, what I would suggest you do is find a bunch of friends and run a bunch of high tier maps. Uh, you will eventually find, an e find essence monsters and you will then be able to kill them and you'll find that they will have more essences than they say. So when they're sealed in amber, uh, you might, they might look like they've got three essences and then when you release them, they might have four. So that's going to be the easiest way to get it if you're in a trade league. If you're in solo self found, you're going to need to hoard your remnants of corruption. So remnants of corruption are the essence uh, essence equivalent of a Val orb. You're going to need to hoard those and look for a natural four essence monster. In my experience, natural four essence monsters only spawn if you are in a map with a hundred with more than a hundred percent increased item quantity. Uh, at least that's in solo play. Once you find one of these, so you know you're running your eight mod eight mod maps. Once you find one of these, uh, you're going to have to hit it with a remnant of corruption and hope. Uh, with this one, for solo self found players, all I've got to say is good luck. Uh, you might need it. Defeat a bestiary boss should be really easy. Uh, the actual bestiary boss encounters aren't that hard, and if you're running your Einhar missions daily, you will have no trouble getting one of the uh, one of the bestiary boss portal beasts eventually. Uh, it is completely RNG to get them, but in my experience, whilst the two best ones are rare, so that's Feral and Phenomus, they're quite rare. Uh, Creation and the other one, the Avian, can't think of his name, uh, those two are just uncommon. Uh, if you run 50 Einhar missions over a map, oh, sorry, over a league, uh, you can expect that you will definitely get one of the bosses. Maybe, maybe several. Okay, so next up we have Complete Harvest Encounters 6. Uh, open maps which are affected by infused Zana modifiers is the limiting one here. So these are all rewards from your uh, from your harvest garden, and the Zana modif uh, the Zana infused modifiers. These are kind of cool. Uh, these are amped up versions of Zana's mods, uh, and these will be the rarest thing that you get. So these all come from tier two and three seed encounters. Uh, so you'll just need to run a lot of tier two and three seeds. If you're doing this, uh, by the time you've run maybe uh, 500 maps, you should have everything in this slot. It's not particularly grinding, and in fact, you may well have it before you've got complete map tiers, which I didn't put in the uh, 
in this, I put that in the first 24. You may well get this before you get that. Uh, it's just a matter of grind. This one requires a bit more luck, so I put it, put it later. Harvest the Heart of the Grove. Uh, Heart of the Grove is the boss of the Harvest Encounter. To get access to this boss, you will need to kill a Tier 4 seed, and then you will need to run a 100 Tier 14, 15, or 16 maps. Once you've done that, you'll get a chance to fight the Heart of the Grove. Uh, I highly, 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 highly recommend that you scour the map that you're running the Heart of the Grove in the first time you run it, uh, and that will make the fight considerably less chaotic. It's a pretty challenging boss encounter. One thing that's really worth your while knowing with it is that if you feel you're losing control, the Heart of the Grove, uh, without spoiling the identity of the boss, uh, the Heart of the Grove boss does a fair amount of damage, but the damage always feels fair. There's one attack that is that can stun lock and uh, stun lock you, and then sort of chain reaction kill you. Uh, not too dissimilar to the Shaper's uh, triple ball. So if the first one hits you, it can stun you, and then the second one hits, and then the third one kills you. Uh, so the Heart of the Grove boss has a fairly similar mechanic. Uh, this before the before that attack, the Heart of the Grove will utter the words "Why fight progress." And then they'll unleash this attack on you. Uh, if you hear the boss say, why fight progress? What you're going to want to do is start circling around them. Uh, so if we just quickly get rid of this spreadsheet for a second, and I'll demonstrate by, imagine that Lani here in the town. Uh, now, spoiler warning, Lani is not the boss of the Harvest Encounter. But let's just imagine that Lani was. Uh, all you need to do is just keep changing the direction that she needs to face in order to hit you. Uh, while the while the Wi Fi progress attack is going on, as long as you do that, uh, then the boss that boss attack won't hit you, uh, and it's the one that really does one shot. I got a feeling, I haven't tested this personally, but I got a feeling that if you were to fight the heart of the grove in a map that had multiple projectiles, that that attack might actually be a projectile, uh, in which case it would be absolutely and utterly brutal. The other thing is that because you're fighting inside the Harvest Garden, uh, you can block line of sight with walls a lot. That grove is big enough that if you start losing control of the fight at any time, what you can do is you can run to the opposite corner uh, and just sort of get yourself a breather, uh, you know, resummon any buffs, refill. If you're using the uh, Rizlatha Pantheon, you can refill your Life Flask and you can allow your natural regeneration to restore your health, your mana, and your energy shield, uh, resummon a golem should you choose to use a golem. Uh, all those sorts of things will help you to win in that fight. Now, I went in completely blind on the Heart of the Grove fight the first time I fought it. Uh, I didn't look up any guides. I thought, no, nah, I'm just going to try and work this out myself. Uh, I got it down with three deaths. The first death that I got was to a Wi Fight progress and me not knowing what to do. The second death was to me lagging and, uh, you know, just it was part connection issue and part being in a bad position. And then the third death was to me stuffing up on that uh, Wi-Fi progress attack again. But I had a lot of close moments, uh, but I was able to beat it anyway. And like I said, that was just going in blind. I feel that this boss is comparable in difficulty to the Shaper and the Elder, but it's new, so we're unpracticed with it. Uh, it's certainly easier than things like Uber Elder, or say, All or the Cortex. Uh, next up we have Complete Deadly Encounters. This is for difficult bosses from the history of Path of Exile. So, that's in the Alluring Abyss. Uh, in order to gain access, you're going to need a set of Mortal Fragments. The easiest way to get Mortal Fragments, well, the first way is to run the Apex of Sacrifice over and over and over again. Uh, the Apex of Sacrifice is the original Atsuri fight, uh, monster level 70. Pretty easy now, although it can still kill you if you stuff up. Uh, and once you've done a bunch of the Atsuri fights, you'll get yourself a set of the Mortal Fragments. Uh, alternately, you can source Mortal Fragments via other means. The rarest of them is Mortal Hope, and the way that you can get that is by running Val Temple Maps. Uh, in the Val Temple Map, there's a Divination card, Last Hope. Uh, three of them will give you a mortal hope, and in my experience, uh, approximately, you get about 1.3 last hope divination cards per Vile Temple you run. 
Uh, so if you run three Vile Temples, you've got a pretty good chance of getting yourself a Mortal Hope that way. And Vile Temples are pretty easy to source these days. Just corrupt any tier 15 map you've got. One in eight chance of it going Vile Temple. So, that's at three. Uh, now, the Alluring Abyss itself is quite difficult. Uh, you, the, it has nasty zone mods uh, in that all monsters deal 60% increased damage and the area is inherently level 80, so lots of damage coming in, uh, but with care, you can beat it. Cheola Who Dreamt was the ultimate boss of the Breach expansion. Uh, Breach is a long time ago now, and there's been a lot of power creep since then, especially when it comes to getting Chaos Resistance. Cheola deals physical and chaos damage and is a lot, 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 lot easier if you're able to go in there and fight her with 60% or more chaos resistance. Now, 60% chaos resistance was a hell of a lot back when Breach came out. However, nowadays, you can actually get as high as 90%. You can literally overcap your chaos resistance to 90% without any meme equipment, uh, just by using your Timeless Jewel, on the Divine Flesh Notable, which is a pretty popular choice anyway, uh, and using a shield, a, particular, a particularly well-rolled shield. That can get you to a maximum Chaos Resistance of 90, and then using a couple of small Cluster Jewels, uh, you can get sort of upwards of 30% Chaos Resistance on each of those. So there's lots of ways to get Chaos Resistance these days, and Chaola is not too hard if you've got Chaos Resistance in the positive 60 or better range. Delve boss at an area of level of 83. So this is going to require you to explore your delve mines quite a bit, uh, push down, 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 down into the depths, uh, into the harder areas, and you will find three bosses if you go deep enough. The third one, all the Crystal King, is very rare and very, very, very difficult. Uh, I think most people, most uh, end gamers consider all to be the hardest encounter in the game. Some people will dispute that and say it's Cortex, some will say that it's uh, Uber Elder, uh, but I think most people will agree that it is all that is the hardest boss. Anyway, uh, all is probably not the one you're going to want to do here. What you're going to want to do is kill either Kurgul or ah Ahumatomi the, um, Ahumatomi the Blind. Uh, these are the two other delve bosses. Ahumatoli is found in the Val cities and in the Grand Architect's Temple there. And the Lich's Tomb has Kurgle the Black-Blooded in the Abyssal Cities. These bosses are somewhat rare. They're somewhat challenging. But the best thing about them is that if you're in softcore and you stuff them up and you die, uh, all you've really lost is your XP and your cell fight. You can go straight back in. You can make as many attempts as you need in order to kill these bosses. Uh, and there's a couple of tricks to them. One thing I will warn you, if you're not familiar with the Kurgle fight, uh, getting Kurgul down to zero health is not the end of the fight, it is the end of the first phase. After you've done that, you're going to have to beat him again, and he has new attacks. So next up we have Harvest the Heart of the Grove conditionally. So this is all about fighting that earlier boss that we mentioned, the Heart of the Grove, uh, whilst avoiding certain attacks. Now, I want to say here that I got these three, sort of for free. Uh, I don't actually know why I got these ones. Uh, I think that these are all close range attacks. Uh, because, I was, uh, because I was killing the boss from very, very, very long range, I wasn't hit by any of these attacks. Sacred Suffering, however, is the one that it seems like it will be the hardest to avoid anyway. What, what Sacred Suffering is, I believe that when you get the boss to 80%, 60%, 40%, or 20% of their maximum life, uh, they, and I think that's the trigger condition, although I'm not sure of that. Uh, they will conjure an aura of uh, vines on the ground around you. So this will encircle you, and you will then need to destroy these. When you destroy them, they will leave a damage over time area on the ground. Uh, you can't use teleport, even teleport movement skills like Flame Dash to get out of this area. And while you're inside this area, you will be attacked by trash mobs. Now, what I would suggest you do here, uh, this is a cheesy strategy, but it's one that I think should work and that I want to give another test to this fight uh, shortly. But what you want to do is to, uh, when the boss is getting close to those health thresholds, so 80, 60, 40, 20%, uh, you want to kite them far, far, far away from the entrance to the zone. Your goal is that when the 
when the aura of uh, thorns, like the sort of the wall of the, it's like the player skill wall of frost, except it's destructible and has a lot of hit points. When that's cast, you want it to be in one of the far corners of the uh, of the arena. When that happens, you want to then burn it down with whatever range skills you've got, and then you want to get out of the entire map by using a logout macro or alt F fouring. Then come back into your map, uh, re-enter, and you'll be in a different spot on the arena. So you've left this area of bad ground, uh, you know, this sacred suffering ground. The sacred suffering is not the actual wall of vines. It's the mess that's left on the ground after the wall of vines dies. So that's what you need to avoid. So that's all I can really say about Harvest the Heart of the Grove conditionally. Uh, I think that, fi uh, that fighting from long range, you'll get these three pretty much for free. And then we have the last one, Endgame Grinds. As always, Endgame Grinds is a grind. Uh, it's a particularly brutal one sometimes. This one seems to be in the middle. So uh, you'll need to pick four of Pick your four poisons, which really means pick the two you don't want to do. Uh, if you're in solo self-found, the ones that you're not going to do, well, you're definitely not going to do Cirrus 50 times, uh, and then you can skip one of the others, but they're all pretty miserable. In fact, I think that this is uh, one of the more brutal endgame grinds for a uh, solo self-found player. Uh, if you're in solo self-found and you're going for 40 or 40, <laughs> good luck. So getting to level 100 uh, is something that used to be an extreme mark of an elitist in this game. Like, that was, you know, someone who was... It was something that most power gamers were in awe of, someone that had the determination and the skill and, uh, to reach level 100. That's changed, and what changed it was the introduction of pure Chayula Breachstones. Uh, these essentially serve as a tradable... as a way to trade your currency for XP. When you run a pure Chayula Breachstone, you'll get a zone that gives a staggering, staggering amount of XP. Uh, it's monster level 83, so it's like a tier 16 map, except uh, I think from memory it's plus 150% to all XP, and there's a huge amount of magic monsters in it. Uh, density is off the charts, uh, so these breach stones are absolutely bonkers. Of course, what people tend to do, because XP goes to everyone in the party, uh, these tend to get run in parties, and... In trade 820 is the area that these get uh, that these get organised. So if you jump into trade 820, uh, you'll find people who will, will have traded for a whole bunch of Chaola Breachstones off other players. They're very, very, very confident that they can beat them smoothly, quickly, and easily. And what they'll do is they will say, Hey all, uh, join me in my Chaola Breachstone. Give me an exalt for each four that you want to join me for, or whatever the going rate is at the time and I will complete the Chael of Breachstone with you sort of la uh, following along behind. Whatever drops uh, goes to whoever it drops for. This isn't the worst deal in the world. The person running, the, running these groups does get the best deal out of everyone in it, but it's not a terrible deal for everyone else in the party either. Uh, so if you're looking to go for level 100, your best bet is to get yourself a powerful character that can lead these Chael of Breachstone rotations and get other people into your parties and run them. Uh, your second best bet is to simply join other people that are doing that. Defeat Argus in the, in the endgame labyrinth. Uh, so this is what I call a puppy kicking mission. What you want to do is wait for a day when Argus is in the very first room of the labyrinth. When that day comes, uh, you want to have already stockpiled your 100, uh, your 100 offerings to the goddess, and you then want to just go and run your labyrinths back to back to back to back to back until you hate life and you hate the world and you hate the game and you never want to step foot in the labyrinth again. Essentially, that is what defeating Argus 100 times feels like. You definitely want to do it on the days when he's in the first room, though. Uh, it's really brutal. If he's not in the first room, it's really brutal. If you're not sure which room he's in, uh, the website poelab.com shows the layout of the labyrinth on any given day. So go there, have a look at the Eternal Labyrinth. Uh, last thing of note is that the Eternal Labyrinth and the three special Uber Duba Labs, uh, they all share the same layout on any given day. I complete Delve Encounters at level 80 or higher in the Azerite Mine. Uh, it's only 500. This one's basically a freebie. Uh, well, it's not a total freebie, but if you're intending to delve to about depth 400, you'll get this one for free. 
and also it's a pretty good source of currency, pretty good source of fossils, uh, and it's a bit of fun, at least in my opinion. Uh, the only reason I haven't got this one already is because my PC has been running so badly this league. Defeat Cirrus the Awakener of Worlds. This is not one you want to do yourself. This is one you want teamwork on. Uh, this is one where when, where ultimately the easiest way to do this is to offer a Cirrus killing service to people. There are a large number of players that are not confident enough with the Cirrus fight to beat the boss themselves. Uh, these players will often look for someone that will help them with it. And because there are people who are desperate to get their uh, challenge credit, uh, those people are actually quite willing to do that for free. So become one of them. If you're very confident that you can beat the Cirrus fight, then look for people who are asking for help with it and offer them your services. Just say, yep, all I want is my in-game uh, um, in grind credit, all the loot's yours, and whatever you do, honor that deal. If you promise someone that the loot's theirs and then something amazing drops, then it's dropped for them, let them have it. Uh, you know, you, you will see your fair share of Awaken Absorbs, you might even see the occasional uh, Awaken Multi-Strike or something like that. If that drops, then pick it up and trade it to the person whose Cirrus you're in. Because uh, if you're in Solo Self Found, the only way to get this is to do thousands and thousands of maps, and to do those thousands of maps efficiently, and to be quite good at the Cirrus fight. Next up we have Defeat Waves of Monsters in the Simulacrum. Uh, if you don't have to tap out of any of your Simulacrums, if you're able to just run them all without failing any, then this is 15 of the map. Uh, these maps uh, have been very expensive this league, uh, partly because people are chasing the Calaminous Visions unique jewel, uh, and they're likely to continue to be expensive, so this is going to be one that's going to require a lot of trading. Uh, if you're in Solo Stuff Found, you're going to need to farm yourself 4,500 of the Simulacrum Splinters, which is a real ordeal. In either case, uh, this is not going to be an easy one to get. Uh, however, if you're in a trade league, uh, often the best way to do this is to find groups that are running the Simulacrum. Uh, now, one thing that's very important, if you're in a group that's running it, uh, the group owner, so the person who creates the Simulacrum instance, that person will get the unique jewel that drops. Uh, so keep that in mind that you, ideally, if you're joining a group to run a simulacrum with people, even if you agree that the loot is shared, you know, to whoever it drops for, uh, if you're not the person creating the instance, ideally you want to only be paying 12 to 15 percent of the cost of a full simulacrum per run. If you're paying much more than that, then you could be getting ripped off. That said, you may be happy to get ripped off just in order to get them done, and particularly if the party that you're running with are super efficient, uh, you may find that that's really worth your while. To defeat Harvest Bosses, Harvest Bosses are the Tier 4 seeds. Uh, so here, this is one that you can do yourself uh, just by running a lot of maps, a hell of a lot of maps, and harvesting everything that you get. Or the alternative is to, in trade leagues, is simply to find other players who have fields full of tier 4 seeds that they want to set off. There will be people who are running the who are running tier 4 seeds uh, just for the purposes of filling up this harvest bosses count. Uh, when they've got say a field that has 10 tier 4 seeds and a bunch of tier 3s and tier 2s in it, uh, they may well offer you uh, a spot in their party to kill them in exchange for perhaps an exalt or something like that. This may be worth your while if you're looking for a way to essentially buy progress on this uh, endgame grind. Anyway, that covers all of the hardest 12 of the challenges in this league. Uh, if you've got any comments or questions, definitely fire away below. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to leave it there and I hope you have a good one.